theme of global urbanisms, relational geographies of East and South. Um, and just a, a very few words about, about the intention of this, um, of this framework. Uh, so speaking in general terms, the seminar series approaches this theme by foregrounding post-socialist and post-colonial geographies, focusing on contemporary issues of social justice across the globe. In spite of the different situated histories and geographical contexts, the two paradigms share a common ground of exchanges that are material, technological, and human, and that can be traced throughout the Cold War and in its present aftermath, where structures of power and questions of responsibility are being reassessed. Um, and in light of this, the Reflection Seminar series also foregrounds the value of ethnography as a method and one that implies an ethics of relation to others um, as a means to develop a dialogue that is able to articulate the role of subjective experience in understanding and thematizing the way we study geographies beyond Western Europe and North America. Uh, and the series will explore across four um, invited uh, lectures, specific notions of infrastructure, care and subjectivity and also how they relate to broader processes of urbanization and spatial politics. Um, it also further seeks to foreground the role of architecture um, and its functional, institutional, and its expressive and effective significances in mediating these relationalities, and to understand how particular histories in these geographies reflect these convergences and di divergences between the East and South. Um, thank you again all for joining us and now I invite my colleague Tanzil to introduce our first guest of the series, Professor Abdelmalik Simon. Uh, thank you and uh, apologies for the technical glitch, but um, well, I mean, Abdelmalik Simon requires little introduction, but I'll just do the formality. So. Uh, professor Simon is a senior professorial fellow at the Urban Institute at the University of Sheffield. He's an urbanist with an abiding interest in the spatial and social compositions of urban regions. Um, and he is uh, also a research associate at University, uh, I'm sorry, a visiting professor at the African Center for Cities. Um, and he brings to the Urban Institute a long background working in urban areas of Africa, South and Southeast Asia with a particular interest um, uh, in the everyday lives of Muslim working class residents, but also uh, what he's exploring now uh, with related to blackness, and we're going to hear more from him um, uh, now. I mean, I don't want to elaborate because, you know, I could go on, you know, introducing him. Uh, so Malik, uh, if you can set aside your uh, the trouble we had with Google, and then I'll share your, the screen, and hopefully things will be flowery from now on. Uh, Okay. Can you just confirm that you can see everything okay? Okay, next, Apenzio. Yeah. Yes. Uh, basically, in one slide, this is the point. And it's not my point, uh, it's Jamaica Kincaid's point. Um, just to say that, that when I'm talking about regions of blackness, I'm not, I'm not going to be talking about uh, black communities, black people necessarily, but once in some sense blackness is in the world, what is it that urban urbanization potentially does with it? uh what does it potentially engage with with it so next slide Tanzio, please so a summary of the talk is this so that urbanization processes that they go beyond the normative logics in a process of extending and the making of extensions and this extending entails a complicated relationship to both the city form and to extended urbanization because while the familiar forms of the city are being spatially extended, at the same time as more prolific extended articulations among different spaces and temporalities also take place, 
there's something else besides these things that also transpire. And what is it? Well, a continuous unsettling of dispositions, an unsettling of built environments and timelines with strange alliances and complicities among supposed antagonists and logics, where it is difficult to work out the proportions of things. Next, please. So what are notions of relations that confound proportionality? Well, it's a different kind of calculation, a different kind of computing what we might call dirty computing, relations within gaps, but also a sense of time as gaps, a generative dimension of forgetting being forgotten. In other words, stop paying attention or stop paying for attention, stop paying for always trying to get attention and its foundation of infinite indebtedness. And where the fundamental relations of value that would seem to underpin processes of urbanization seem to be all over the place, always turned around. And where apportionment, a working out of inequalities, access and accumulation is not anchored in the working out or contracting of proportionality. Rather, it's a matter of spectral intimacy, strange alliances and inventive adjacency across distance. Something specific coming into the world that seems to resist or be indifferent to the transitive always something becoming something else, or rather a becoming that never seems to land anywhere. So it always brings with it its own sense of a mobile, of a mobile home. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the summation of the, of, the, of the talk, basically. So capital's operations have always depended upon extracting value from the specific characteristics of a locale. And then as the relative value of that locale declines, identifying other locales with different yet related characteristics from which value might be extracted. And so blackness's function is a critical medium through which this process takes place. For blackness operates as the model and the means through which value can be continuously converted, dispersed and relocalized. Next, please. But just as blackness is mobilized as a means of extending capitalist operations, blackness is itself is extended as a means of articulating purses and places that otherwise may be forced apart. It renders them a part of something that is yet to be completely figured. And as blackness has wavered historically in its use between being nothing and everything, this sense of extension of blackness extending itself to others, of being a means of extending the capacities, cares, and concern of people held in place or held up as objects of theft, figures something else, something tremulous, provisional, and often contested. So a play of extensions. So as blackness extends capitalist operations in the process itself is extended, in ways that can't yet be pinned down or necessarily captured. And this process is witnessed in different parts of the world not commonly considered as black, from the volatile mixtures of ethnic and nationalist aspirations in Eastern Indonesia, as youth experiment with blackness as a way to find themselves to each other, to the ways in which youth across Northeast India attempt to find common cause amongst long histories of being pulled and kept, kept apart. Next. So beyond these considerations of conversion, of all blackness being the currency through which value and things are always converted into something else, there's the, also the question then within this conversion about what holds the urban in place, what holds its populations and sensibilities, labor, economic and symbolic coherence. So moving from the holds of ships transporting slave labor, the holds for the display and sale of black bodies, the apparatuses of mo mobilization on plantations, the architectures of mines, and the geological codifications of earth processes, all of these have underpinned the deployment of the fungibility of black and indigenous bodies. So the, the, the mechanisms of capture always entails a sense of, fungib of, of this notion of, fun of fungibility, of always something being that, that the hold in some way is secured through this capacity of, 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 
of incessant fun of fungibility. Black, black labor, black bodies can be anything and, e and everything, nothing and everything. Next, please. Here, black existence is converted into signifiers of exchangeable value that know no limit, that instrumentalizes the human being's essential absence absence of defining characteristics and niches to become through violence a constantly refigured domain beyond what is instituted as the definitive human. Next. This process haunts the capacity of the urban to hold anything together as a coherent e entity. So no matter how well the surveillance operates, no matter the lures of citizenship, no matter the ways in which effective and emotional life is curated to respond in particular ways, no matter the provisions of services and welfare by states, the agglomeration of economic functions and their forward and backward linkages across space. Despite these things, the city is haunted by the violence necessary in order to ensure the scalability and consolidation of the plantation and mine as critical motors of urbanization. Next, please. So holes are architectures simultaneously intersecting interdiction, boundedness, intimacy, and belonging. In other words, they're ambivalent. They bring together these, these different aspects. So it has been important to keep in mind the discursive politics and violence necessary to suture these things together. And that operated, for example, through managing the intensive spatial proximities of masters, overseers, slaves, and the indentured. These proximities contain the overcoding of genealogical ties for some, whites, and their total abruption for others, blacks. Also, the regimented temporalities of industrialized agricultural production and the seasonal cycles of the plot, as Sylvia Winter and Catherine McKittrick have pointed out the total surveillance of social spatial organization and the dissimulative operations of black spiritual practices. All of these being held together, sutured through this kind of violence. But there was something inseparable here. And so all attempts to scale and enclose, all attempts to hold are punctuate, punctuated by a certain waywardness in Sadia Hartman's terms. Next, please. So consider the urban extensions, the peripheries, the suburbs, the hinterlands. This sense of waywardness is more scattered and ambiguous. The sheer heterogeneity of developments at all scales, from thousands of small developers to large real estate corporations, have equipped regions with a large number of warehouses and housing estates and mega residential developments and industrial zones, commercial centers and small enterprise districts, that either, either never got off the ground or only partially fulfilled their intended function or desired rates of occupancy or quickly fall apart. So these extensions are, 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 are a landscape of all kinds of temporal trajectories where it oftentimes is very difficult to tell you know, what's, what's, what works or what's not, what's viable or, or, what, or what isn't. Next, please. So when these projects are coupled with large swathes of squatter settlements and temporary migrant houses and the conversion of older residential neighborhoods into mass boarding houses, it is possible to grasp the extensiveness of a circulating population that is in place across multiple tenuous residencies. A population that remains completely unanchored in serial short-term occupancies or are continuously displaced as a function of different instantiations of urban renewal, the migration of employment opportunities, or the increasingly opportunistic sensibilities of residents themselves. Next, please. All kinds of discrepant environments become momentary bastions of largely improvised collectivity where people try to make some functional use of each other without pretense of any long-term commitments. Momentary, sporadic, and makeshift become the defining metaphors of many collective formations. And this is what then I would consider as regions of blackness. But within these regions, 
Everything there is entangled in ways difficult to read as separable differences. What is occupied or unoccupied? What is viable or not? What distinguishes the short term from the long term? Even what distinguishes the settled from the unsettled? The black juridical theorist Denise Ferreira de Silva has emphasized the ways in which difference has been mobilized to constitute regimes of separability. And importantly, the mode of calculation that institutes liberty as entwined with property. So that the protection of citizenship was to be secured through availing both land and self to the terms of property. Property was something that was always in need of development. It wasn't simply that one was able to possess land, but property is something that always needs development, in need of being attached to measures of productivity. And this required a taming of the land, the, imp the imposition of disciplining maneuvers exerted by the position of the owner. So the imbrication of the property form on the body of blackness made it available to the coercive force of possession required to impose a specific disposition on both body and land, to detach both body and land from its organicity and ecology. Next, please. Now, urban governance and analysis is predominantly focused on what differences mean, what and how they signify. But an economy of differences without separability, and this is, this is the Silva's term, differences without separability, maintains the possibilities of computation to introduce new improbabilities into the world. So once the black body is revealed as featureless flesh by the violence imposed upon it, there is the danger for the capturer, for the master, that this flesh will do something that cannot be grasped by any language and any form of control. Next, please. Here, a potentiality, brutal though it may be, emerges out of the most blatant disregard of one for another in a fundamental act of misrecognition, but which unleashes from the humanity denied another plane of extensionality. Extensionality in the terms of a flesh without definition, which saturates the field with the very questioning of distinction and which challenges the presumption of the individual as a master of a life of their own. The logics of comparison, contrast, dialectic, contradiction disappear into an elemental position of the incalculable and thus the possibilities of spaciousness. Here there is also refusal of the game of trying to prove oneself as human, of trying to prove oneself as being good or worthy as anyone else. So regardless of the urgency people have to make a living, to put bread on the table, there is a substantive detachment from trying to anchor one's life in a specific place or territory. Circulation and movement become the practices of everyday inhabitation. And while residents may not move very far, it is imperative to keep moving, even as a means of deflecting being the target of police, familiar judgments, familial judgments, restrictions or obligations, that continuously unsettled discernible relationship with place or occupation. Next, please. But the difference between precarity and subjugation and life's priority, that is, its waywardness and incomputability, is itself an inseparable difference. And this inseparability is particularly important and considering the complex entanglements of urban working in lower middle class districts a much, a much, across much what is called the, 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 the South. That is, in part, what, what De, De Silva points to in terms of differences without separability is itself the kind of um, the situation where it's often difficult to disentangle what is precarity, what is subjugation, and what is its wear, waywardness and incomputability. So the entanglements among household composition and entrepreneurial networks and financial reciprocities and dependencies, the profusion of tipping points, the multiplicity of risks and impulsive maneuvers, the intensive scrutiny of individual behavior coupled with indifference largely shown to individualized needs,
it constitutes a thick fabric, even a flesh that's difficult to alter and, re and reweave. Here, residents are constantly doing something, but are increasingly unsure about what that something may be, about what it means, about what value it has. It's not a matter of false consciousness, but a conclusion that consciousness is normatively figured is itself false. Next, please. Yet the repetition of this entanglement, this thick entanglement that's difficult to oftentimes recognize what's virtuous or, or what's toxic, provides the semblance of a stability in a way that, that what's, what, what ensues is not necessarily a precarious life. And, and residents will want something different. They, they often at the same time express confidence in what they have now. And oftentimes their situation is largely felt as being all right. But it also constantly points to the limit of what it can be and turn into. The attainment of stability just this side of precarity then becomes both security and trap. But this both end relation of difference is precisely the locus of its spaciousness, of its collective possibilities. I mean, think of, if you think, I mean, to, to, like, to experience this, listen to the, 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 the live version of Love Supreme that was released this year by John Coltrane's group in Seattle and listen to McCoy Tyner on the piano. And just this both end in the relationship between the modal chord progression on the left hand and the melodic extension on the right hand. Left and right hand are inseparable, but they do different things. And the different things produce a, a tension, but that tension is always pointing to some an unanticipated potential. So this entanglement of both precarity, subjugation, and waywardness and incomputability, that tension is always generating something that can't be necessarily an, an, an anticipated. Next, please. So the capacity to live with its manifold expressions and impulses and risks, it so often seeks to be structured by a measured proportionality. That is, if only people were to adhere to specific mindsets and diets and behavioral regimens and investments, their prospects for longevity would be enhanced. Similarly, then, the conventional assumption is that the terrain on which justice is to be done would entail removing the impediments that foreclose longevity to the oppressed and condemn them to slow death. Next, please. But the question Fred Moten raises is not so much whether justice is indeed done through such an orientation, but rather that justice itself is inapplicable to apprehending the ways in which the eruption of such normative trajectories, the tumultuous spilling out of life in wayward and inexplicable ways, is both the product of subjugation and the product of life's priority, and that it is sometimes impossible to navigate and separate this distinction. So it, it means that there's a politics of inhabitation that goes beyond the restitutive and reparative logics of justice. It's something that's more spacious as life's expressiveness or more precisely the modalities through which life is activated to resist notions of fulfillment, sustainability and property, as in life's being a series of properties to be cultivated so as to maximize its value. Here, politics is not directed toward either reversing dispossession or repossessing, but rather using the moment of dispossession to prefigure or predispose the available unbodying of the dispossessed to forms of gathering, sensing, and living that do not fully complete the process of resocialization in the terms imposed by the mobilizations of political rule, infrastructure, accumulation. It doesn't mean that large volumes of awful violence are not brought to bear on resettling the dispossessed into new regimes of incapacity, but rather that the trajectories of dispossession can never be charted or sure. For there is an urban aesthetics that renders any overarching organizational logic inoperable. We may walk through the streets as we always have, we may be caught up in the same routines and expect the same results of these redundant actions. But these are invested and acted with a sense of always something beyond, right here and now, through which the familiar could veer off into new directions. 
an eerie form of an aesthetic arithmetic that suggests that whatever appears in front of us is always less than and more than at the same time. This in turn is life's priority. And one can begin to see the, uh, next slide please. And one can begin to see this kind of arithmetic that stretches the notion of what we understand to be computability. That there is within computability a vast terrain of the incomputable. So if we turn to sort of Luciana Parisi's work on, on, on algorithms and computability, and the way in which computability now entails a matter of techniques that are brought to bear on basic pattern seeking, which is algorithmically mediated. For now, as techniques attempt to turn around any input in terms of all the relations it might have with others, invert and multiply the normative lines of causation and the recursive recreation of standard propositions, and finally incorporate what have always been considered to be distractions, calculations that branch out rather than reaching any statistical consensus that attempts to match symbolic inputs and outputs, thus bringing in know-hows of different languages through a continuous elaboration of interactional possibilities. This form of the incomputable within the computable then generate different forms of subjectivation that value things differently and begin to give rise to strange commonalities and resonances as manifestations of a distributed cognition, a shared mind not differentiated by readily discernible boundaries. Next, please. What Ramon Amaro and Tandy Lowenson would call black technics, a multivalent array of incomplete processes of becoming, a constantly shifting ensemble of lures and bluffs and circumventions, reverberations, fugitivities, extraterrestrial tunnels and subterranean satellites, or Janelle Monet's dirty computing, that surfaces propositions for the world that appear to come from the world in ways that disrupt the ability to know in advance just exactly what the world comprises of. Next, please. And this is, and this is close to what, what Brian Masumi calls the surplus value of life before it is an economic value, where he says the theory of surplus value in the richest sense concerns the singular vivacity of a quality's appearing such as it is, just this, and the revivication this potentially bequeaths, a theory of surplus value of life. It recomposes the pattern, it recover, co colors the halo, it, it invents new patterns in its bid for freedom. Next, please. So urbanization, it, so given that, then what, what is, wh wh where, do, where does this go? So urbanization itself has long been a means, not just a site, to work out just how space, people, materials, language, exchange, and forces are brought together and in what proportion. This intercalation, this extra layer, this making a gap or interruption, this surfeit of organization is not so much a mysterious force, nor the invisible hand of some godlike market, nor divine intervention, but it's relation itself. Relation is a tremulous provisional attentiveness, witnessing and holding as if in a super, superposition. Connection, yes. Suturing, no. Next, please. Consider an informal settlement, a green field that has been spontaneously or incrementally invaded or settled over time. The way in which it appears, its manifestation of organization was already inherent in the ways in which prospective residents envisioned their positions within it. Questions of who would be close to the road, the borders of the settlement, who would take more central positions or those in between, who would prioritize locations that might facilitate the acquisition of authority or better servicing, or places more immune from unwanted incursions. How much space would one take in terms of the ability to defend particular places or to divide or consolidate later on. Next, please. Without ever being subject to words, to avert negotiations, the entire complexion of such settlements could be worked out in advance, as the process of settlement itself was not a univocal matter, but rather it's a matter of a complicated choreography of many different potentialities, 
challenges, countervailing tendencies and competing trajectories, all in relation to each other, but without any definitive calculation of proportion. And these settlements are rarely settled anyway, just be, just, not just because of their structural precarity or usual lack of stable tenure, but because these relationalities are continuously producing different kinds of differences, any one potentially substitutable, substitutable for the other. Next, please. So cities are full of territory, sectors, and dividing lines that bring differences to the light of day and keep differences in their place. But the application of the line, that which marks the differences, is not, be, is not beholden to any particular will or agenda. The line is simply a kind of technical instrument. It doesn't follow a particular kind. It's not beholden to any particular will or any objective. It's simply a technical instrument, a life of its own, that marks a process of contingency as much as definitiveness. So what I do is contingent upon what you do, which in turn is contingent upon what another does, and so on. It's a process where lines always ramify and nothing can be held in over any overarching coherence. There's always a gap. But these gaps are occasions for relations, not in order to suture them, not to make seamless space, but rather are there reasons for being. And it's a conundrum that can't be solved. Next, please. So mind the gap, mind the gap. The gap, all those spaces where nothing seems to happen. But when they are crossed, something changes, and something changes perhaps forever. Gaps, all those barely indiscernible spaces that would seem to divide centers and peripheries, one postcode from another, potential from precarity, as well as a temporal maybe. Maybe you will succeed in crossing the border, and maybe not. Next, please. The gap reflected in the enduring inability of things to be settled for sure, even within the enduring imaginaries on the part of the unsettled for some virtuous emplacement, even though the unsettled most know that it will never happen. For the gap points to a zone beyond inhabitation, not only where inhabitation is not normatively seen as possible or probable, but where the question itself is suspended as a matter of life's priorities. Again, it's waywardness. Again, it's always veering off the charts. It zigzags its way through enactments that would seem to undermine its prolongation. Not in a desire, not in a death drive, not in a desire for termination, or not in the declaration of some super immunity, but simply the magma of living with its errant flows and total irresponsibility. Next, please. And so what I, I, in a forthcoming book, I, I call this process the surrounds. And by that, I mean spaces beyond capture, not immune from capture, not free from it, but something aside it as a kind of locus of continuous rebellion. Rebellion that might always look like rebellion. And something that often borders on a kind of wretchedness that is nearly impossible to look at directly. But such rebellion enables us to stay focused on seeing something in the now, of making what we have presently available in a different way. Something then not only that of a social refuse and refusal, but of a refusing and remaking that accompanies such refusal. So this work is not about specific political tactics or even political critique, but rather disorientations, living slightly askew, but ever active in terms of pulling together, putting things together. Next, please. It's not some alternative reality just over there, just beyond the tracks or the near horizon. These surrounds, they're sometimes heterotopic, sometimes exceptional, sometimes intensely specific, hidden in plain sight, prefigurative or dissolute. They entail the possibilities within any event, situation, setting or project for something incomputable, unanticipated to take place. For cities are replete with clearly designated spaces. You know, we have industrial zones, there's carceral zones, administrative, and so forth. But there's always something left over in their operation, something not completely captured by the terms of their respective functioning. There are spaces that seem to converge elements of all these functions, spaces that are partly carceral, partly domestic, partly administrative, and so forth. 
but it, we can't determine always the proportions. But spaces where the proportions of each characteristic are too difficult to recognize or stabilize within any calculation. Just as soon as you think you know what they are, they move on. Or the function you have staked your analysis on is suddenly superseded by others. So it is the relationship between spaces whose complexion goes beyond their function while maintaining them, and spaces whose functions are never clearly stabilized because they seem to absorb so many characteristics that make up the place of the surrounds. Each of these distinct circumstances surrounds the other. Next, please. I mean, Glissant points to this also in his notion of incommensurable simultaneity, relations that are disruptive of perspectives rather than confirming them, attempts to get away from the imperative of relating, because that imperative of always trying to, to make things relate and make them connect and make them fit is suffused with the coloniality of territorial conquest, the domination of a single view, the domination of a single we. Next, please. So the surrounds, and, 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 and going back to this, this, this notion of blackness being the, 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 the mode and means of incessant conversion of value, of incessant fungibility, then it's important here that the surrounds consider the operations of infrastructuring that go beyond stories about how things got to be the way they are to expose people to ongoing series of actions and forms of gathering and modes of being together that construct a particular kind of access to the larger world that ensconce actors in materialized sensibilities of encounter that are specific to the immediate environments, environs in which they, they operate. A specificity that isn't fungible, a specificity that can't be converted, a specificity that isn't transitive, that isn't tr easily translatable. The borders between urban territories, again, constantly shift between different kinds of designations, zones, attachments, intimacy, circuits, and shifting forms of authority. Next, please. Yet the ways in which the intersections amongst conduits of movement, spaces of relative domesticity, the modulations of public and private interaction, the routines of everyday social reproduction, and the vectors of sensation marked out by the materials and designs of built forms generate a specific orientation and capacity a specific imprint on the larger surrounds. So one has to, given, given, given this, sort of, these, these, this specificity, one has to navigate their way through all of these unsettled elements and propositions. All these elements and propositions that don't easily translate, that are not easily convertible, that aren't easily proportioned out. And built environments themselves become the materialization of those navigational practices, just as they avail possibilities of navigation. But it does make it difficult to see built environments as representative of any overarching macrostructural dynamics. Next, please. Environments that are something specific, immeasurable, and untranslatable that infrastructuring makes possible. And one might see this as a kind of form of material resistance to the discursive oriented domains of policy and design that seek to attribute particular values and positions and measures of efficacy to a particular territory. Now, it doesn't mean that, that do these domains are superseded by these specificities. It doesn't mean that, you get, that, you're, that it's possible to get rid of measures and proportions and, and, and calculations. It just means that they always are going to fall short and that there's a way and that this is there, there's a way to to materialize that falling short there's a way of materializing something else beside them that takes particular kind of form a, another a, 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 another albeit tacit dimension of collective agency such specificity of material resistance can be important in terms of engaging the potential trajectories of territories that otherwise might look similar, be subject to basically the same array of conditions, yet diverge in terms of how they do or do not endure. So we're, we, too easily, we too easily make judgments about certain kinds of urban landscapes and say, oh, this is just, this is gentrification, 
or this is just another example of cheap, affordable housing, or, I mean, we, we, we tend to sort of say these are examples, they exemplify certain things. But what often takes place is that environments that may look like absolutely the same, that may look so generic that we think that is going on, become exactly the kinds of environments that in some ways allow for a complexity of operations to take place simply because in some ways the they because the 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 the, the visibility of those environments elicit this kind of thing where oh we know what's going on so we don't have to pay attention so they become a, a certain kind of a, a strategic opacity which allows a lot of different kinds of complexions and heterogeneities to take place so in some sense things might look similar but may, many different things may be going on next please so what I want to what I want to then what what this points to is the essential brokenness of the world. That is, in some ways, the gap, this notion of of, of a gap, of relations that can't be sutured, uh, of things that can't be disentangled, of things that can't operate in the terms in which they're specified, is a kind of default position of brokenness. And that to stay with that brokenness is, is important, of things out of their proper place, no matter where they end up or how they're used. And it's, a, it's an economy that goes beyond reparation to highlight how that brokenness suggests its own propositions, devoid of the will to restore functionality or repurpose elements from the brokenness to dispositions that they have little interest in defining. To, you know, as, as Donna Haraway says, to stay with the trouble, perhaps to stay with the, with the, with the, bro the, the, the brokenness. Even though, I mean, to, to acknowledge that, you know, as Catherine McKittrick so amplifies, it is hard to be broken. It is impossible to be broken. But yet in some ways, no matter how hard it is to hold on to that position of brokenness, it is also, it is also dangerous to circumvent that which brokenness itself suggests. So rather it seeks to perpetuate a stake of brokenness as generative of a continuous circulation of materials across different hands, different sites and different uses. Here relations are proposed that are detached from obvious genealogy that compress things conventionally viewed as impossible to be together and that have no way of knowing whether or not they will endure. Next please. So not integration, not synthesis, not consolidation, but what Tina Camp refers to as the effective work of adjacency, the making of relations in spite of and because of the differences of experience and power. So again, we, it's important, I think, to fundamentally rethink, well, what do we think of and make uh, urban relations? What is it that, what could we bring together? What does urbanization in some ways permit, uh, facilitate, uh, that we just simply are not, are, are, are not taking advantage of or, or, or not, not engaging? And again, this notion of, 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 strange, of strange alliances among things that not usually thought to go together. So storytellers engineers, healers, urban data analysts, street brokers, priests, a kind of flesh, not for the reapportioning, the derivation and speculation on difference, but for difference, for the communism of difference. Each is to its other, can do the work of other without indebtedness or without judgment. Thanks, Tanzio, that's it, thanks. All right. <laughs> Uh, Yulia, you're muted. <clears throat> you can, you can, yeah, you can go ahead, Yulia. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks, Malik. I mean, uh, now.
the way we had scheduled it is that the last 15 minutes is for open for questions. So um, if you just raise your hand and then uh, just pop the question to Malik directly because we just wanted to create that exchange of views really. So I don't want to read out questions. Uh, so uh, yeah, Vanessa. Ah, please go ahead. I see. I see. It's, it's difficult to take all in. Um, thank you, Malik. That was wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was. I absolutely agree with the fundamental brokenness of our world. I really like it. And your face that maybe that leads to what we can repair. I think it uh, sends me thinking a lot. But I was the other day with Miguel and I, we were talking, and uh, I, I quote to him Olivia Lane on The Lonely City, and she says, There is a gentrification of our cities, but there is also a gentrification of our minds. And the way we kind of are constructing lives in which no amount of suffering can have any space, and, and that's perhaps creating new forms of calculation that match to these utopias of perfect, clean, rational, rationally planned cities. So um, I wonder how, I, I, maybe I haven't formulated the question, but how much of this blackness also relates with our conceptions of, of us as individuals and who we are and, and how we should be. Uh, so it's, it's an idea for the good city, but it's also an idea of the good life or something, and whether you'd like to reflect on this very inarticulate question. But the first one. <laughs> You're asking what's a good life? What's a, what's a good city? What's a good... No, no, my, sorry. My question, I think, is, is that, that idea of the gentrification of the mind, mm. the, of whether are we allowed to actually suffer, suffer and have suffer as a part of, we have to completely eradicate that suffering and have this ideal perfect lives in which nothing ever happens. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm wary about the instrument instrumentalization of suffering as the, as the, as the, as the predominant incentive, as, as, uh, or as a kind of legitimation to continuously intervene into particular spaces and ways of, in ways of doing things, um, and in the. And in the and also the, in the concomitant investment in suffering as the as the kind of primary mode to which one draws attention to oneself in one situation in 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 in, in the world, um, and to what extent is is To what, it, what extent is the sort of curation of individualized suffering uh, itself a kind of urban economy, a kind of uh, uh, a kind of surplus value uh, that gets used as a way to to control and to and to steer? Um, this is why the this is why the the this is why some of my my Indonesian interlocutors will say you know forget about being forgotten um, that somehow there is a kind of space where one can configure something beyond the need to register through one's victimage or, or one's yeah uh vanessa you said that was the first question did you have one more or should we go to the next one no no i was just making a point <laughs> okay i'm trying to take uh, malik's talk in <laughs> okay. and i was with the first question <laughs> okay all right so i think we have a question uh from this uh from the well uh emre 
Yeah, so we have two questions, one from Lakshmi and one from Victoria. So we can start with Lakshmi. Let's go for this one and then... Could you come forward to the screen? Because I think otherwise it will be difficult to listen. So, am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, in today's evolving times, something like the donut effect has resulted in the boundary of the city surpassing geography. Uh, the city then becomes a mere perceptional place or idea rather than an actual geography. How then do you retain the identity of the city and how do you understand the definition of an actual urban space? I mean, I, th I think one, 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 one retains the city not as a kind of conceptual object um, or not as a kind of imp either an empirical object, um, but as a space of operations that is, is materialized through how many people that you can recruit and enroll for a particular kind of action or, 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 or a activity. Uh, becomes a particular kind of locus of, of, of inter intersection. Um, but in terms of the relationship between the city and, and the urban, um, the urban, um, as, we, as we all, I think, are well know, that the, the processes of urbanization are no longer iconically embodied by, 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 the, by the city. Um, so the city becomes a kind of anachronistic object in some ways uh, but if it is in some ways abandoned and vacated um, as the as the as the representative of certain kind of urbanization um, and increasingly abstracted as a kind of locus of fictive capital and and, and abstract interactions um, there are spaces within it there are shadows there are crevices there are interstices within it that uh, clearly are being reoccupied for a wide range of different kinds of, of, of maneuvers. Um, so in some ways, the city retains itself as a kind of locus of, of operations for who, who, can be, who can be assembled, who can be gathered for what purposes and under what auspices. All right, uh, Emrid, was there a second question? Yeah, there's another question coming up. Okay. Hi, Malik. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm sitting here with a lot of students of urban design, yeah? So like for the, I'm just wondering, something that I think a lot about when I read your work and as you've been talking today, is it makes me think a lot about, so much of what you're talking about for me becomes about, for those of us who teach design and architecture and planning, for those of us who are studying this, like the complicity of our, these, these, the, the complicity of these disciplines with particular forms of violence, right? Um, against particular groups of people. And so I'm wondering, as you've been talking about in this presentation, sort of these things that are often you're almost asking us to think beyond that which is built, to think more widely from not just designing the city to those things that we don't necessarily, the things we often take um, for granted, right? The ways that people are assembling, their ways of sort of coming together. How does one use design processes or architectural processes or planning? What does it mean to sort of almost discard sort of a, a persistent focus on the material, the physical, to now try to design with or for these kinds of processes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. No, I mean, I would, I, I, I would say that, it, that, that 
that the it, it requires a kind of ex, expanded notion of what we consider to be materialization. Um, for example, I just I I, I just I, I just spent several weeks in a in a in a, a new district of Tangier that is being being constructed all at all at once, all at the same time, and it's. Um, Okay, the state the state allocated some kind of land 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 divisioning, some kind of land planning. But the 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 building of the the building of the district is the work of thousands of different actors, you know, human and non-human human actors. Um, and so, how is it being how is it being built? Well, it's being built. But, but certain kinds of access to materials, but you know there are all kinds of circulations of rumors and ideas about who's available to work as particular kinds of crews. There are different ideas about where materials can be accessed. There are different kinds of back and forth between different kinds of authorities that meet in different locations. There's the way in which people who are interested in, in trying to maybe live there and operate there circulate through each other. All of all of these navigations amidst each other is is contributing to the materialization of what that district is going to eventually look like, um, and it is a materialization. So, in in some ways, it's the it's the 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 the, the, the sedimenting of particular kinds of availabilities, the way in which particular kinds of resources and particular kinds of things are made available to each other what they can see, what they can hear, what they can provide each other. And that is in, that's constructed not by the sort of overarching layout of a specific plan, but a kind of process of planning, which is much more heterogeneous and complex and involves really sort of multifarious circuits of exchange. Um, and it's just simply to try to pay attention to these things and just to, in some ways, to see them as part of the process of materialization um, and the ways in which people, as you're, as you're suggesting, the way in which particular kinds of lives and bodies and efforts and initiatives are marginalized or excluded from that kind of materialization. But it doesn't mean that in our, our notions of the built environment and planning built environments, that we need a much more mobile and expansive notion of what the material actually consists of. Uh, all right. Uh, we have a next question from Abhishek. Hi. Thanks for the amazing presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, I have a question in regarding to the mind gap, which you mentioned about, which you're talking about. So. You postulated a few ideas where the mind gap could be seen through different multiple worldviews. So I want to know, like, you know, what's your worldview? Like, you know, how do you see that mind gap in the context of urban south, and what role does the, that gap play uh, in the urban context of the south? No, I'm, but what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to, what I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that that no matter what geography we're talking about, that there are particular kinds of holes that, that get created. How do, you, how do you hold things in place? How do you hold attention? How do you hold uh, a kind of coherent, how do you hold people paying attention to each other? How do you hold some kind of collective effort? And those holes are always in some sense ambivalent because they entail different kinds of aspects that sometimes that on the surface wouldn't seem to go 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 together so there are in some sense in any whole a series of of of, of gaps ways in which the whole just the whole can never hold um, and so that that sense of the sense of of gaps is always in some sense of of holds moving 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 on um and how you it's the the, the 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 gap between the 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 need to settle things and to unsettle things it's like within with any within any neighborhood there is in some sense the need for things to cohere 
for people to recognize each other, for things to be clear and apparent to each other. But if things are too clear, if things are too repetitive, if things are too much the same, then that whole, that collective can no longer function because it atrophies. It needs to expose itself to new ideas, new ways of doing things. But if the exposures are too all over the place, then the coherence begins to slip away. Then the whole begins to slip away. So what I'm suggesting is that there's a, always a gap there, a gap between the need to secure but the need to go beyond, the need to settle and the need to unsettle, and how those gaps operate and, how you, and, and, how, and, and what those gaps suggest in their own terms without always the need to fix things, without always the need to return things to a prior mode of functioning, or the need to always change things into some new kind of vision. Those, those, that, that gap is always that kind of interstitial space. And so how do you think about it? How do you work with it? What is it? What do you do with it? This is the kind of problematic that I'm, that I'm trying to suggest. Thanks a lot. And I really appreciate, like, you know, I really appreciate that that gap is actually realized by a lot of urbanists because where I was working uh, as urban designer, one kind of misses out on those, those gaps. There's always, you know, a potential to let's fill the gap, let's fill the gap. And I'm glad it's not seen that way everywhere. Thank you. All right. Um, we are over our stipulated time, but if there is any last question, then we can take that. Uh, Oh, I'm, I'm glad there isn't any because I'll just probably end with one. So, uh, Malik, you know that we have talked about this before, but this idea of moving beyond the methodological individualism, because you, you, you brought this up with this idea of a shared mind, uh, with this idea of a distributed cognition. How does it tie in with the politics that you talk about, a politics beyond the you know the very normative notion of justice or the uh, you know a politics beyond uh, because you meant you kept talking about the politics beyond but I wanted to you know to see if there is a connection to to achieve that politics beyond the normative notion that you uh, you know point to what is that role of the distributed cognition and that you know the po politics in the truest sense of forming a polity which is going beyond the individual. So, I mean, that's a relationship I'm drawing in your mind. And I don't know if it resonates or would you care to comment on that? I mean, it, again, it's a kind of, it, it, it is a kind of, it is, it is a, a kind of ambivalent, ambivalent politics because it entails the politics of a kind of extension of an extensionality. Um, I mean, if, if the notion of freedom and liberty was so much wrapped up in the individuation of property and individuals that have certain kind of property, and if, for example, blackness was the mode of operation that could not recoup a sense of self as property or being dispossessed of property, but operated, manifested in its own extension, extensionality. You know what is what what is the what are the what what is the what is the locus of emancipation? Um, and this is this is something that is, in some sense, the emancipation has to be an emancipation of, of a shared cognition in some way not in terms of individual rights, not in terms of justice accorded to the individual sense of, of, of liberty, uh, but an emancipation of a, of, of, a collective pos of, a, of a collective possibility. I'm not quite sure what that, what that looks like, uh, but it in some ways is beyond the, our, the available tropes of, 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 ju of justice. I mean, I mean that's a the open-endedness is a good point to end, I guess. So you know, we all can start to digest um, the ideas that you presented. And thank you so much 